Welcome to the Less Doing Podcast, where you will learn how to start living more by doing less. Let me help you optimize, automate, and outsource your entire life so you can focus on doing the things you love. Now here's your host, Ari Mizell. Welcome back to the Less Doing Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Mizell, and my guest today wants to make sure that you never lose a customer again. Hey, Joey. Hey, Ari. How you doing? <laughs> Good. Thank you. So Joey Coleman, he's the founder of the Design Symphony, and he's also the author of the new book, Never Lose a Customer Again. And Joey is a master at crafting customer experiences. And that's the very first thing that I want to talk about before we get to how you don't lose them. But how do you create an experience and why should people like what is the difference between an experience and a non experience? I think to me, the two words that are the two phrases, if you will, that people often confuse in this space is customer service and customer experience. And I like to think of customer service as what you do reactively, either when something goes wrong or because a customer takes a certain behavior, or follows a certain path, you kind of react by providing them with some service. Customer experience is things that we do proactively, right? It's getting out ahead of the customer and trying to anticipate where they're going, what they need, what they're going to uh, experience when they interact with you. And it's really about how you make them feel. And so I think what happens is a lot of businesses get up caught up in delivering their product or service and missing the opportunity to track how their customers are reacting or how their customers are feeling as they navigate through using your product or service. Okay. And then and that's actually, I never heard it put that way before, which is really a good way to think about it. I think, what are some of the things that what do you want people to feel? I guess is really the question. I know that's probably brand dependent, but it's, it's not sure. an obvious answer, right? We don't want just everyone to be happy. Like that's not enough. Right. I think that the secret, the first step is to acknowledge what they're feeling at that point in the relationship. And then secondly, to acknowledge if that feeling or those emotional reactions are working for your business. So for example, when someone first makes a purchase, brain science tells us that the brain floods with dopamine right? They feel joy, euphoria, and excitement that this is the product that's going to be answer, the answer to their dreams, or this is the service that's finally going to be able to help them out. But brain science also tells us that almost as quickly as that dopamine hits the brain, it starts to recede. And lack of dopamine in the brain produces feelings of fear, doubt, and uncertainty. What if this product doesn't work out the way it was supposed to? Will I be able to get my money back? What if the service that they sold me in the sales process doesn't really match up to the service that actually gets delivered? And as a result, that emotional feeling that they're happening right happens right at the beginning of the relationship is often referred to as, in common parlance, buyer's remorse, right? Where we begin to doubt the purchase decision we just made. What I would love businesses to do is just acknowledge the fact that your customers are having going to have these natural emotional swings just by the very nature of them being human beings. And we need to be ready to jump in and meet them where they're at. So at that point in the game, it needs to be all about reaffirming the decision they just made, giving them confidence that you are going to deliver on your promises that you made during the sales and marketing process, and giving them a preview of the experience they can expect long term with your business. Because everybody presumes that things are going to be good in the beginning, and then they're kind of all going to fall apart. And what you need to be doing as a business is to be reinforcing regularly that no, the best is yet to come. Like this is good and we're treating you really well and you're loving the way it's going. But guess what? It's going to get even better because the more we know about you, the more we learn about you, the more we build our relationship, the better we're going to be able to deliver on what you need, whether that's emotionally or in terms of the product or the service. Yeah. And so it, I'll tell you, like, personally, the keep the faith video idea that, that you've written out before has been really cool for us because, and so for people who don't know, in our situation, we have events that we do three times a year and uh, someone might buy a ticket to the event three months before the event happens. So when you have this sort of big separation or, or any separation really, right, between the purchase and the delivery, in the middle of that period, we want to send this video being like, hey, just want to remind you like what you signed up for, what it's going to be like. So it's exactly what you're talking about. That's been a huge one 
one for us. Oh, I love to hear that. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, and I respect the fact that there are many businesses that sell a product or service that they aren't going to be able to deliver on for some time. And it's that gap period that is really important for you to keep confidence and keep excitement high. Now, cognitively, the customers who buy tickets to your event, sorry, they know that the event isn't going to happen for three months. Like they're very well aware of it. Right. They're adults. They're cognizant human beings. The problem is our thinking brain and our feeling brain are two separate things. And while they're connected, and I, you know, we don't get in, need to get into an entire discussion of neuroscience here, while they're connected, for most people, the distance between those two is quite great. And so we need to be, as the business owners, taking responsibility for continuing to jump in and remind them, yep, it's going to work out okay. This is going to be awesome. Oh, I know this is a difficult part. You know, I've been in the process over the last few months of writing my first book. And one of the things that uh, my editor has done incredibly well, and which is, and I say this respectfully, from other friends that I talk to are writers, kind of an abnormality in the world of traditional publishing is to kind of remind me that, okay, the things you're feeling in this part in the process are very natural to feel. Like what you're going through, this is very natural. Because you, otherwise, as humans, we get into our heads and say, oh, it must be me. It, it, it must be breaking because of me. It must not be working well because of me. When the reality is, it's just a marathon to write and publish and release a book. You know, that's just how it works. Yeah, absolutely. And so now you had a lot of research going into this book particularly, right? And so just for people who we know are going to have to read this book, because I've already had three people on my team read it in addition to me. So oh, I love yeah, it. we're I love loving it. it. <laughs> what, good, good. I'm so glad to hear that. What was the impetus for this book? You know, you did the first 100 days. That whole schema. And then so what got you to want to put this book out there? Well, you know, what happened is I was running in a branding agency. And what I realized is that you can't differentiate on price anymore because everybody expects the lowest price. You can't differentiate on quality because everybody expects the highest quality. You can't differentiate on, you know, how your product is available when someone else's product isn't available, right? Because everything's expected to be available 24-7, 365. So the last great differentiator is the experience. And that sounds great on paper and make your customers feel good sounds great on paper. But I was working with large organizations that were like, Joey, we need a system. We need a process that we can follow. And so over what really has been, you know, close to two decades, this system has evolved and refined and, and grown. And what I did is I looked at, you know, the clients I was working and tested this. And after I felt I had enough data to prove that these models worked in businesses that were small startups, solo entrepreneurs or large, you know, Fortune 500, you know, international conglomerates, I felt, all right, now that I feel it's proven enough enough, let's put it down in a book that hopefully will stand the test of time and be something that people can continue to come back to year after year. Yeah. So, I mean, and you've worked with all sorts of different companies and you know, you've obviously experienced this stuff yourself. So you wrote about something in the book about a dentist, but I, I was curious, what's one of the, that you could share, what's one of your favorite customer experiences that you've personally had and one that you've crafted? Oh, that's a good question. I feel very fortunate and very blessed that I've had some incredible, incredible customer experiences over the years. One that I had recently, so I'm a professional speaker. I speak at events and conferences. I'm on the road about two and a half weeks out of the month. And I also am married with a four and a half year old and a two and a half year old. Now, before any of your listeners get anxious about, oh, geez, what kind of dad is he if he's gone that long? They come with me about 70% of the time. So we found ourselves traveling up to Canada for an event, and we were staying at the Banff Fairmont Springs Hotel, which is considered in Canada to be one of the best hotels. It's known as the Castle in the Rockies. And because of our flights and kind of coming from another event and everything that was going on, we arrived at the hotel at about midnight, and we'd been pretty much traveling all day. And I don't know how much time listeners have spent traveling with children ages four and two. <laughs> Everyone's tired at the end of the day but magnify that by an X factor when you're talking about children. 
And as I was checking into the hotel, the gentleman behind the counter says to me, Mr. Coleman, are, the, are those your children over there? And because my wife had stayed back with the kids. So because they were right on the verge, we could tell we were really close to the meltdown. They weren't melting down, but they were right on that, that verge. And I turned around and I'm thinking, oh, geez, is one of them climbing a wall or something or doing something crazy? I'm like, oh, yes, yes, those are. And the gentleman checking me in said, would it be okay if we gave them a gift from the hotel? We have stuffed animals and king's crowns, right? It's the castle in the Rockies. And I was like, of course. And next thing I know, my kids are getting like big plush stuffed animals, right? Not the the little like, oh, here's the stuffed animal we got for 50 cents that we're going to give out and act like we care. No, these were significant stuffed animals with, you know, Fairmont uh, Bamp Springs t-shirts on and, you know, big solid crowns that would last for a long time. And in that moment, it dawned on me that one of the best ways that you can create a remarkable customer experience is to recognize the emotional state where your customer is in. We were low, right? We were tired. We'd been traveling all day. And then often surprising and delighting the people who are with your customers has an even bigger impact than surprising and delighting your customer. So had they provided me with something like, oh, here's a free t-shirt for checking in or here's a bonus or here's a discount or whatever, it would have been nice. But the fact that they surprised my boys made me think, now this is going to be a fantastic hotel to stay at. So that was one that I experienced recently that I just absolutely that, loved. That's a, I think that's a really wonderful point. And actually, before I get to the second part of that question that I asked you, that one of the things in business that I always notice and that I find interesting is when you have a business where the buyer is not the customer, you know, and so you have this in extreme cases like a tow truck company, for example, or even in a uh, like a sports coaching program, right? So the, where the buyer might be the parents, but the customer is really the child. So, and that's something that business have to consider when their businesses are in that sort of situation. So I think it's a really good point. Yeah, I'm a big believer that everyone thinks that they have, when they make a sale, that they have a customer. You have many, many customers with every sale. And I'm not just talking about the difference between, oh, if you're selling software into a large enterprise corporation or something like that. Of course, you have everybody that works in the company. But if you sell a shirt, you have multiple customers. So some people might say, well, wait, Joey, only only one person's going to wear that shirt. Really? You know, and I, and I say this with no judgment, but it often comes up this way. Often my wife will grab one of my shirts and wear one of my shirts, which is great. And I love and I'm totally cool with that. But then she's a customer too. And when I wear my shirt on stage, everybody in the audience is a customer as well because they're making judgments about me based on the look of the shirt. And so there's all these people that come into contact with our products or services that may not be the ones writing the check or signing on the dotted line of the contract or giving us the money, but they all are customers that are related to the interaction. The second question he asked me is, you know, what was one that I was involved exactly. with? Yeah, that I crafted. I, I want to, if I may, I want to deviate, and I'm happy to come back and tell about specific ones I crafted, but there's one that I think for your audience in particular is really going to resonate. I know, and I've always thought of you, Ari, as kind of the king of automation, right? The guy who figures out all these great ways to navigate his life and get things done without needing to, you know, spending brain power on it once at the beginning and then replicating it multiple times. I remember some time ago hearing a story that you told about flipping a light switch to pay someone that was cleaning your house, if I'm remembering yeah, baby, the story, story yeah. correctly. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the babysitter. That's right. The babysitter, you know, and, and if you haven't heard this story and correct me if I'm wrong, Ari, you know, Ari would basically flip a light switch. And if he did it, it would send a message that's meant to automatically pay the babysitter. And I'm thinking, how cool is that? Because as someone who has kids and, you know, is regularly paying sitters and things like that, it's like, oh, wow, that would, every time I flip a light switch by our front door, I think, oh, if only this was paying someone right now, <laughs> that'd be fun, right? So I give a speech a few years ago at an event and there was a guy in the audience by the name of John Goodman. John runs a uh, program called Online Trainer Academy. And Online Trainer Academy is all about helping people to become certified to become trainers, right? personal fitness trainers. But what John does is he's probably been one of the best students of the first 100 days of my methodologies. This guy looks at every interaction he has with his customers and figures out ways to make it better. 
He said, I talk about him as a case study in the book because um, the typical refund rate in the online course space is 20%. That's the average that everybody will admit to. In many courses, it's actually higher than that. So what that means is that 20% of the people who give you money ask for a refund. And they usually do that by hitting your credit card. So it makes it very difficult to keep a relationship with a credit card processor. And you don't really know if your sales are legit sales because there's a high likelihood that they're going to refund on the back end. John recently did a launch, which he shared with me and said I could share publicly, where they did $1.5 million in revenue and had a refund rate of 1.07%. Now that's a fraction, fraction of the average. And he posits that the reason for that is because of first 100 days and what they do in the first 100 days to create a remarkable experience. One thing they do, which I absolutely love, it's an online course. They send you in the mail a physical workbook. Now, most online courses, when you buy the course, you get a PDF that you can download and print and fill in the blanks. And let's be candid, having purchased many online courses, and many of your listeners probably have too, they rarely get printed. They rarely get filled out. You just watch the videos and maybe you complete the course and maybe you don't. John makes sure that there are real world physical touches, which are kind of the antithesis of the online world, to make sure that his customers are having a great experience all the way along. And the reason I mentioned this story in particular from an automation point of view is it allows him to track in the training software where the customer is. And as they complete certain modules, it automatically triggers things to be mailed to them or sent to them that are outside the sphere of operating within the course. So you can imagine completing a module and then getting a note card that says, hey, congratulations, you're halfway through the course. And it's a handwritten note from the owner. Now you're really motivated to keep going, right? That's a particular example that I thought would resonate well with your audience as something that they would appreciate given the automation. Yeah, I love that. I'm just actually writing down notes on that because we have an online course. Yeah, the idea of doing a physical (laughs) workbook is, I mean, I'm not going to say it's obvious, but it's a really good one. I'm glad you think so. Yeah, it's it's fun. And and I give give all credit to John. That was, he heard the talk, he built on it and we communicate probably, oh, I don't know, every two months or so, he'll send me like, Joey, here's my next cool, coolest thing. He just changed the packing tape on all the materials that he sends is a caricature of himself kind of pointing at the person <laughs> and smiling, right? So it, even the packing tape he uses is branded and personalized and fun and playful. And it really works with his brand spirit, right? He's a motivator. He's all about getting people to be better trainers and to kind of interact online. And and now he's creating these physical re- real world examples. Yeah, and I know it's John so actually fun. personally too. And he's, I mean, he's a machine. So it makes sense to me that he would do this. Yeah. <laughs> totally. John writes something every single day. It's amazing. So as far as yeah. specifically like events, for example, and you know, you and I both met at Mastermind Talks, which I think is one of the best examples of an experience I've ever seen. But what are some of the more innovative things you see people doing in events? events that really help to solidify those experiences. Well, since you mentioned Mastermind Talks, let me tell a story about that one. Uh, you know, Jason Gennard is a good friend of both of ours and runs an incredible event. I mean, Mastermind Talks, for for, for a reference for listeners, is a $10,000 annual price tag for a three-day event where there are only 150 people. And the rule is that he never lets more than 50% of the people come back from the previous year. So it's a really hard to get into event with a high ticket price. And he relies on a regular influx of people who are interested in attending because every year he starts from scratch with 50% of his seats, right? Now, the other 50% people fight over like crazy. Like he'll have 150 people come and 125 will renew for 75 seats. And so he has to graciously figure out a way to tell 50 people that, no, sorry, you don't get to come back. But he has to get those other 50 people in or those other 75 people in rather, you know, to fill in the new spots. So one of the things Jason did is he ran this really fun referral contest where he basically said to everybody who was in, hey, there's a couple extra spots. Who wants to refer someone? You know, you know, the caliber of people we're looking for, etc. And he got a ton of referrals, which is great and would be the envy of most businesses. Most businesses, when they ask their customers for referrals, it's like cue the tumbleweed. Crickets, nothing 
things happening and we're like, oh, why aren't they referring people to us? Jason, because he had built such a strong brand and such great relationships, had amazing referrals. But he didn't stop there. The next year at the event, he's got everybody in the room and he says, I want to acknowledge the people who made referrals that have people sitting in the room. And he read out the names of everybody who had done a referral and everybody was super excited and like who they had referred. And this was awesome and contributing to the community. He then had a giant tumbler on stage with little ping pong balls with names in it. And it was the names of all the people who had referred prospective attendees to the event. And he spun it. And like we often have seen in, you know, drawings pull would pull out a ping pong and it would have ball and it would have the name of the person. And theoretically they would win, win, win a prize. And that was pretty cool. And you know, that's standard and Jason is anything but standard. So what he does is he says, we're going to give a draw do give it, have a giveaway here as a referral prize for an all expenses paid like week long or 10 day long trip to Africa a safari, all expenses paid, everything in. And he pulls out two ping pong balls and everybody's thinking, oh my gosh, are, are, is he giving away two prizes? And he says, no, what we're going to do is these two people are going to come up on stage and have a push-up contest. And whoever can do the most push-ups <laughs> wins the safari. Now, in some audiences, right, this would not be a good choice, okay? I've been to plenty of conferences where this would not go over well with the crowd. But in a room full of hard-charging, overachieving Uber entrepreneurs, this was a brilliant idea, right? And like this co push-up contest went on for a while. I, I think when it was all said and done, you know, the winner was at like almost 50 push-ups. And, you know, doing 50 push-ups on a stage under the lights in front of a crowd with no advance notice while you're in quote unquote pseudo business clothes, <laughs> business casual anyway, um, is it is a little bit of a pressure environment, but it created spectacle. It created experience. It created something remarkable that is worthy of telling a story about. And so that's an example, I think, of somebody who's doing something at the event that is a, that is setting the seed for later when he asks for referrals, people wanting to contribute because they know there's amazing prizes to be won. There was no announcement of the prize when he originally made the ask. So this was another surprise and delight moment where the customers experienced something after the fact that rewarded them for the behavior that he yeah, wanted them to do. Yeah, that's a great point. So what is the best way for somebody to start this process in their own business? Where should they be looking? I mean, you know, you said that John looks at every interaction. Uh, maybe it's that simple, but how, do, like, I want to get into that mindset that you have in terms of how you look at what can be improved in that customer experience in people's own businesses as they're listening to this. Well, I think the first thing you need to do is have a very accurate and honest assessment of what your customer journey is now. In the book, I talk about the eight phases a customer has the potential to go through from the moment they first start considering whether or not they want to do business with you, right? The assess phase. Up until that point, like with Jason's clients that we were talking about for Mastermind Talks, where they are advocates, right? They reach the advocate phase where they're a raving fan referring other people. There are eight phases, so six additional phases between those two that your customer is going to go through. What I think the first thing you need to do is map those out and say, all right, at this phase, what are we doing? And to be completely candid, Ari, I have done this with thousands of companies. And when we just put the map up on the wall and write down what we're doing under each phase, it immediately becomes obvious what needs to happen. Like immediately, right? We look at a phase and we realize, oh, so that buyer's remorse phase that I talked about earlier in the episode, we don't do anything during that phase. You know, people, for example, and I know you guys do a great job of this, but, you know, people in the event space who sell a ticket and they're like, yeah, we sell a ticket. And then two weeks before the event, we start sending them things. Oh, this is what you need to pack and get excited, etc. But the two and a half months between the sale of the ticket and when they start getting the pre-event emails, yeah. there's nothing happening. That's a great opportunity to say, well, let's just do something. Half the time, folks, it's not about what you do. It's that you do something. It's that you let the customer know that you're alive, that you remember them and that you care about them. We're not building rockets here, right? This, this isn't, you know, a crazily complex task. It's about treating human beings like humans and recognizing that we're all busy. We all have a lot of things going on. And yet the opportunity for you to stand out in the crowd is quite easy because the bar yeah. for customer experience is lying on the ground. They don't expect anything. So if you do anything, 
it's setting you apart from the competition. Well, that's pretty good. That's, 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 that's a really good place to start. So then, Joey, with <laughs> actually, I wasn't planning on asking you this, but as far as the the travel that you're doing so often with your family, I have four small children, and the idea of doing that is it's not nightmarish, but it's unsettling. Right. So I know you, I know one of the things is that you started doing it like I right, think your right. son was two weeks old or something the first time you traveled with them, right? Correct. Yeah. So my four and a half year old has been on over 450 flights. He's got Incredible. stamps from 11 countries in his passport. My two and a half year old has been over on over 200 flights and has stamps from eight countries in his passport. So the boys grew up traveling. Like they know when we get on an airplane, they put on their seatbelts, they actually pull out the safety card, right? They're the only people on the airplane that follow the flight attendant's instruction and pull out the safety cards. And then what's happened lately is my four year old narrates the pictogram. Yeah. You know, on the safety card, how it just has pictures of what happens. He'll actually narrate it, which I think is probably pretty disconcerting for the people in earshot because he's. you hear this little four-year-old voice and it's like, if you look outside the window and you see fire and smoke and debris... Do not get out of the plane, you know, and I'm sure people are like, oh, my God, what is going on? What is this kid talking about? So uh, I guess so the, yeah, the they, big tip there is start them, start them early. But so as somebody who has two kids and travels a ton and is a customer experience expert, what's your favorite airline? Delta, 100%. Wow. We are loyal, loyal Delta customers. They are incredible. They treat me incredibly well. This is not bragging, but just for context, I'm a diamond level flyer on Delta, which means I do 125,000 plus miles a year. One of the things I love about Delta is not how they treat me. It's how they treat my boys. They go out of their way. Every time my boys get on the plane, they want to go in the cockpit like immediately as soon as we're boarding the plane. And the pilots are always so gracious. The last flight we were all on as a family, the pilot not only was explaining what the different buttons were doing while they were doing their pre-flight check, but he actually said to my four-year-old, do you want to press oh some God. of the buttons? <laughs> Which saying to a four-year-old, do you want to press some buttons on this light-up panel? Was it, But my son, I think, misunderstood it as, do you want to fly the plane to California? And I was like, no, buddy, you get to press some buttons. You don't get to ride up here, right? Because he was like, daddy, I'll just sit up here and I'll see you and mommy after the flight. I'm like, <laughs> no, actually, that's not how this is going to work. But, you know, they, they go out of their way to embrace the young frequent flyers. And what that does is it levels the emotions, right? Lots of times the reason people, you know, get antsy about kids on planes is kids don't like to sit still. Heck, adults don't like to sit still. But we acknowledge socially that we have to in an airplane, right? Kids don't like to do that. So if the pilots and the flight attendants give the kids some opportunities for engagement, they acknowledge them instead of ignoring them, suddenly the kids feel like they have yeah, status. Okay, and so that's, I mean, that's great. Easier. And you actually, I don't know if you've been, fo- I'm sure you have actually, but there's been a lot of stuff in the news recently about people fostering the idea of having child-free flights. Yeah, I got to say that stuff drives me insane. It drives me insane. I'm sorry. First of all, number one, everyone who's fostering that belief was a child once. Number two, I guarantee if we talk to people who knew the people who are suggesting that, they were not the most fun child to be around. I know that sounds overly judgmental of me, but in my experience, that's the reality. Number three, having been the person on the plane with the screaming child, because every once in a while it does happen, folks, those of you that are annoyed by the screaming child, please know that the parent is more annoyed than you are, okay? The parent is struggling mightily with this 99% of the times. Occasionally, you have the parent who just doesn't care and lets their kid do whatever, but those are the exception to the rule. Most time, the parent is dying a thousand deaths. The other thing that I think is a little crazy, and no, I, I'm, a, I'm ranting it. here a little bit, so I apologize, sorry, but you, you've hit on a, a subject that I have some very strong opinions on. Two things. Number one, parents, you do not need to bring little bags of candy and treats on the plane to soothe the other passengers if your child makes a sound. That is unnecessary, and it conditions people to believe that everything around them should be perfectly sterile and perfectly quiet and perfectly stable at all times. That's not the reality of the human condition. Don't encourage that behavior. Second of all, the number of people who have gotten on the plane and looked at my wife and I because we're sitting there with our two boys and thrown us the evil eye or the skunk eye or a scowl is insane. It's insane. It happens almost every single time we fly. We get multiple looks. And invariably, a good number of those people after the flight will come up and say, I'm so sorry. Your child was absolutely incredibly well-behaved. I didn't expect that. 
And I was like, wow, thank you. I really appreciate it. I didn't expect you to yeah, be the kind of person yourself. you acknowledge <laughs> after the look you gave us. Because I'm like, stop it. Stop behaving that way. Take care of yourself. If you're taking care of, you know, yourself, and it was my dad used to say when we were growing up, Joey, you've got a full-time job taking care of yourself. Same advice, I think, applies to all adults. First, make sure that everything you're doing is absolutely fantastic and wonderful, incredible. Yeah, and, and then you know, worry the, about just what other people not are to doing. keep going on this, but I mean, I've traveled quite a bit for work too, as usually by myself. But I have a jacket that from Bowbox. It's a Kickstarter thing, and it's got a built-in eye mask, and I have earplugs. I see, and it's not because, and by the way, screaming kids are, I'm kind of immune to that noise at this point anyway, but it's like, that's my space. I get on the plane, I'm going to go to sleep and that's it. Like it's my problem. Right. Take care of that. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Take care of yourself. There are uh, incredible, incredible solutions to solve these problems. And invariably it's the flight is not that long. I mean, sure. If you're doing an LA to Sydney run, you know, and you're 19 hours in the air, that's a different story. But in those scenarios, if you'll notice, most of the flight attendants on those flights will allow the kids to run up and down the aisle. Heck, the people are running up and down the aisle and stretching, you know, the adults. So it's like, just, yeah, own your own stuff. And I'm a big fan. Last thing I'll say on this is the best way to get better at creating experiences for your customers is to have incredible experiences yourself. I personally believe that one of the most impactful way to create amazing experiences is to travel. Because by traveling, you will have incredible experiences and it will give you food for fodder to come back to your own business and your own life and make it better. So I'm a big fan that, you know, I wish every American had a passport. It's sad and heartbreaking that, you know, depending on whose stats you look at, something like 70 to 80 percent of Americans have never been out of the country. Get out of the country. Even just get out of your town. Jump in the car. Drive four towns over to that town you've never been to, yet it's so close. And walk around. Have a different experience experience, drive to another state, you know, fly somewhere. I, I get that economics play into this as well, but there are opportunities to explore areas of your own town that you've never explored. And from doing that with open eyes, you will I, get a I different that's, perspective. That's, excellent. that's very customers. sage advice. And actually that, I think that's probably the quote of the episode is best way to create better experiences to have more of them in yourself. So that was great. So the last question that we always like, to, I always like to ask on these interviews is what are your top three pieces of advice for people to be more effective? And you can interpret that however you like. My top three pieces of advice for people to be more effective. This is a very timely question for me because there are a lot of things going on in my life in the interest of full disclosure. There are areas where I'm not being effective and I know it and it breaks my heart and it's frustrating and it's troubling, but it's the reality of the situation. I will say this, number one, decide what really matters right? I believe it is impossible to be effective in every single area of your life at all times. Decide what your priorities are and decide what matters most. Number two, look for ways to release control. I speak a lot with entrepreneurs and I'm an entrepreneur. I want to have my hands involved in everything that my company is doing and everything that I'm involved with. The problem is there's not enough hours in the day. So pick the couple of things that you want to have domain on and release the rest and let it go. And number three, be gentle with yourself. We are so, so incredibly hard on ourselves as human beings. All the research shows this. All of our life experience shows this. And by the way, if you're an entrepreneur or a business owner or somebody that is leading people, statistically, you're harder on yourself than the average person. I think we need to be more gentle with ourselves. And by default, if we are more gentle with ourselves, we'll be able to be gentler with others. And I think that is how we actually become more effective as human beings that. instead that. of human doings. Pretty good, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll have links in the show notes, of Thanks, course, buddy. but where's the best Thank place for people to find out pleasure. more about you, get your awesome book and start crafting their own great experiences. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. So the best place to find me online is my website, Joey Coleman. That's J-O-E-Y, like a five-year-old you know somewhere. Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, right? Like the camping equipment, joeycoleman.com. The book's available everywhere that you would find books. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your favorite indie bookstore, physical stores, online stores. We've got it in hardback. We've got it in ebook. We've even got an audiobook. So if you've enjoyed listening to me on this podcast, you can 
and listen to me narrate the entire book on the audiobook. So I would love people to check it out. And I'll, I'll say one more thing about the book because we talked about that buyer's remorse early on in the episode. There's actually a guarantee in the book. And the guarantee is as follows. You buy the book, you read the book, you don't like what it says, you don't like the message, you don't find it useful. You send me an email and I refund your money, period. That's it. I believe and I've tried to write the book in a way that it will pay for itself before you are, you know, two or three chapters in. And so my goal is that people actually read it and put these things into practice because I believe that improving your business's customer experience will force your competitors to improve theirs and it will force every business in your community to improve their experience. And next thing we know, all boats are rising together. And if we can get the customer experience increasing and improving globally, it's a better planet for all of us to live on. Thank you. That's wonderful, Joyce. So I really appreciate your time and I hope everyone gets them a copy of this book and starts changing their own experiences. Hey, we each only have 24 hours in a day, right? Why not make yours more productive so you can focus on amplifying your unique abilities? Join us over at the Less Doing Labs. It's a free, exclusive community filled with tips, tricks, and tools to multiply your efficiency. Just sign up at lessdoinglabs.com slash 24 hours. That's lessdoinglabs.com slash 24 hours.